I'm going to ask a few questions to get the discussion rolling, and then we'll open up for a broader discussion. I will go around with a mic. I'd ask everybody, actually, first I'd ask everybody to turn off their cell phones uh, <clears throat> or anything that goes beep. And then uh, secondly, when uh, we do go around with the microphone, I'll just ask people to stand, identify themselves, and to ask a, uh, uh, a question concisely. So, Jerome Kelly, welcome. Good to be with you again. Um, let me just start by asking you to talk about Southcom. You know, what is it? What does it cover? And, and really, what is your job as the COCOM for Southern Command? I think probably everyone here uh, knows that the, you know, there are six geographical combatant commanders, uh, one in uh, KCOM, Pacific Command, another Central Command in the Middle East, uh, the Africa Command, European Command, um, and uh, Northern Command, which is the United States, uh, with responsibility for interacting with uh, Mexico and Canada. In, in my part of the world, I have all of the Caribbean and uh, Middle East south of Mexico. Uh, with the exception, actually, the Bahamas, I don't quite know why uh, that's the case, and then the U.S. possessions. Uh, Puerto Rico as an example, American Virgin Islands. So, large area, you know, English-speaking, Caribbean, very different than uh, the Latin American or the Spanish and, and Portuguese-speaking Latin America. One of the things uh, I learned early, very early on is they are really different countries. There's a tendency in the United States to think, well, everyone down here is the same. They're not. They have their own wonderful country. They have their own, uh, you know, very similar languages and religion, that kind of thing. But they're, uh, you know, the Colombians are very different in, in terms of their history and their things that make them proud than, than the Bolivians and the, you know, so it's a very, very different place. Uh, so that's, that's the geographical part. Uh, I'll, get, I'll, I'll get it out early with Cuba. Have nothing to do with Cuba and, uh, we, you know, we see the war. I don't. The U.S. government, State Department's working that. Uh, some potential for the future. We can probably talk about that. But um, what do I do? The, the, the three things I do more than anything else is I partner with those nations, and the vast majority of the nations in the region, like the United States, uh, you know, see the United States as a, as a very definite partner. Wish, actually, there was more uh, partnership. Uh, and I don't mean money, I mean just serious interest partnership in the region. Tremendous trade relations with uh, Latin America, and generally speaking, very, very good uh, uh, political and military military relationships. Some of the countries we don't, Venezuela is an issue, Ecuador, Bolivia, if that's their choice, um, I don't, <clears throat> we can talk about that, but I don't, I don't uh, mean to criticize, but that's their choice, and they're going in a direction that uh, most people in the region don't understand at all. Um, you know, there's some things like that. Um, so partnering. Um, the other thing a great deal of is, part. I guess part of that partnering is working with them, planning with them, standing by to help them in the case of humanitarian disaster. Um, we have everything from hurricanes in the, in the Caribbean, as you might imagine, is, is kind of the primary concern. Had no idea how many volcanoes there are in the region. Uh, the, the Central American Isthmus is an example. Huge tectonic plate shifts, so constant almost uh, earthquakes in places like Chile and, and uh, in Peru. So we partner with them and any pandemics and things like that. Uh, so any of the humanitarian assistance is very helpful. Second thing, and then finally, uh, uh, drug interdiction. Uh, partnering with them at the source to try to get at the source of drugs. Uh, you may or may not know that 100% of the heroin, cocaine, and most of the methamphetamines now that are trans, uh, brought into the United States are made in Latin America. Um, huge business, uh, all driven by our drug demand. Uh, huge profits uh, that then get turned into uh, some real detrimental effects on, um, on the countries that we deal with in terms of bribery, extortion, murder. Uh, we're very, very effective in seeing electronically and otherwise the movement of the cocaine or the drugs. Uh, don't have a lot of assets to stop it, although we, uh, we do stop a lot, but not nearly enough. As an example, last year, uh, with cocaine alone, 191 metric tons of cocaine collectively we, we, we stopped, captured, zero violence, uh, but still plenty of uh, So maybe, maybe that's enough. Yeah. Let me ask you just one uh, particular Southcom related question, then I'll, uh, well, two. Uh, the first is, I think most of us tend to think of the Columbia experience as a great American success story. Plan Columbia, 
bipartisan, uh, you know, the Colombian government really tremendously successful against the FARC. The, the, um, and of course now culminating in a, in a peace process with some issues, but culminating. So one question I, I would ask you on that is, how translatable do you think that model is to other parts of the world? I mean, that's if you want a, a really good success, that's it. But does it translate? I, I think it does. I mean, I'm not necessarily sure it would in, in, a, in entirely other culture. But um, I've come to learn that the things that the, the, the number one thing that changed the dynamic relative to Colombia was the Colombian people finally having that whole, you know, that tada moment that said, if we don't do something, we are going to be a failed state. We will not be able, you know, the, the, the people who have any money at all, we're not going to be able to live here. Um, and uh, we, a, a number of conferences we've had in CELCOM, we've done it up here as well, you've attended a couple of them. You know, the recognition by the Colombians are that we were at least as bad that they were at least as bad 20 years ago as the Central American republics are today. Nearly failed states, all driven by our drug consumption in the United States in terms of the corruption and the murders and all that, to a large degree. Um, and in fact, to, to you know, kind of export the Colombian experience, and again, it started with the Colombian people changing, and they changed their tax code, and they, the military changed to much more rights friendly, if you will, a lot more coin versus trying to fight and shoot their way out of the war, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I think 80% of the countryside of Colombia, something like that, was either controlled by or influenced heavily by the FARC. Today it's 4 or 5% going down. 20 years ago, 80% uh, of the Colombian population were at least sympathetic to what the FARC was doing or trying to do. Today it's tiny. Um, so, Taking that as the model, uh, we had conferences, and again, you've been in a couple of them, where we took spokespersons, uh, the current uh, Colombian ambassador of the United States, formerly uh, uh, Kim Jong, formerly the Minister of Defense, uh, uh, great, great guy, but to say the least, living in Princeton, speaks English fluently. I asked him to come to Miami, uh, where we had a conference with the Central Americans primarily focused on Honduras, Guatemala, and uh, El Salvador. But everyone came. We invited from Mexico all the way to the Mexicans came, and, and, and not their presidents, but their uh, three senior military guys. The only country that didn't come was Nicaragua, which is disappointing, because we had not bad relations with them. Mill to mill, uh, town of Brooklyn. Uh, but anyways, I asked Minister, then Minister of Defense, Kim Jong, if he wouldn't basically do a seminar focused on the Central American countries where his country was 20 years ago, and what they did over the last 20 years to get to the point now where they're just about to end 52, almost 53 year history. And it was just nothing less than brilliant. And from that, uh, two things really, um, that you, because the countries are so small and they're on this trafficking route, they can't do it alone. So they have to, you've got to take a regional approach. And they finally came together and understood that. And then the other issue was to come up with a plan that could be presented to the United States and other countries, much like Plan Columbia. This is what we think we need economically, socially, militarily. This is what we think that law enforcement, this is what we think we need. Over time, and we helped them at, uh, in Miami, it, it then it, it grew into what is known as the uh, Alliance for Prosperity. That they subsequently presented to our president, our vice president here in Washington, and uh, we've had great hopes, and it's still out there, and we're still looking for. And it's not the alliance of prosperity is what they're going to do for themselves, but it gives a, a you know a start point for what other people might do to, to, to help. So uh, I think it's I think it is exportable. Mm -hmm. S uh, second question, I think, uh, in light of uh, what happened in Paris. Um, I think one has to ask, you know, as you, as you look at uh, your area of responsibility, think about Islamic State, but also Hezbollah and so forth. Is, are there are those issues that are relevant at all, or is that really a, a Middle Eastern, European, North African kind of phenomenon? They're everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. Um, 
way, the way I think of the networks that uh, encase the world or almost encase the world is that uh, I've come to learn in the job I'm in now that there's a, there's a transnational organized criminal network that is that encases the world. And it's anything that you want to buy or anything you want to move, you move on that network. Uh, so cars, so drugs in our own country, uh, the United States, hundreds and hundreds of tons, tons of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, uh, move into the United States in exactly the right amounts to feed our drug demand. I don't even worry about marijuana because it doesn't flow from Latin America, it flows from, from Mexico and flows most of the strong, or much of it's grown in the United States now. But I'm told thousands of tons of that move on that same network. Tens of thousands of human beings. Uh, the UN tells us that every year at least 20, roughly 20,000 young women, mostly kind of late adolescents, very early uh, adulthood, move on that network for the sex trade. Uh, not to mention economic refugees, uh, aliens with special interests that we don't quite know what they're, they're up to, but we know they're up to no good. Um, so, and if you want something in a sense that, that comes out of Central America or, uh, or another part of the world, that network, this transnational organized criminal network, will bring it to you here in Washington. Um, so that's a very, very well developed networks around the world. They're not, no, no one person controls them, but they are all interacting. I think the way I envision it, the Islamic terrorist network, Islamic extremist network, uh, is very well developed in Central America, sorry, in uh, CENTCOM, in, in the Middle East, and is getting more and more uh, sophisticated as it grows out of the Middle East into, say, uh, Northern Africa now going down into parts of Africa. I think Paris and other indicators will tell you that it's pretty well developed in, uh, in parts of Western Europe. Um, in, my, in, in the part of the world I live in, uh, I know that some amount of money out of the tremendous you know, eye-watering profits of the drug trade, cocaine alone is in the neighborhood of something like 85 billion a year. Uh, that has to be laundered. You know, the, Traffickers, their biggest problem is not getting drugs into the United States, it's laundering money. Uh, we know that it's laundered in part uh, through various banking interests that have reached back to, say, the Lebanese banks. And we know that Hezbollah takes a certain, uh, gets a certain benefit. We don't know how much, but we know it's a lot. Um, again, the, the, in terms of the ISIS, there, there are uh, several very, very radicalized mosques in the Caribbean region. We know that some number, upwards, certainly past 100, probably less than 200 of uh, young people have gone to the fight in Syria. Um, uh, recently, a pretty, a pretty uh, high uh, visibility uh, kill of a, of a Trinidadian um, in, in, in Syria. Mm -hmm. My concern with ISIS, uh, and of course the ISIS and, and other Islamic uh, radicals, that the, the message kind of more and more is, stay where you are and do your work. Don't you know, go to Syria, just you know, do it whether it's in Chattanooga or in uh, Trinidad Tobago or in Montego Bay, Jamaica or wherever. Uh, so the concern I would have, and again, it's, it's, uh, if I'm reminded, Congressman, it's not a military concern, it's a law, more of a law enforcement concern, but that's probably my greatest, uh, in my part of the world, my greatest concern local radicalized, of which there are a fair number, who just stay in the region and do dirty work and then soft target. Uh, think of the two, there are millions of Americans that, that enjoy food out of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Tampa, Texas. Uh, one day stops in wonderful countries, but a, but a very soft target. Well, thanks. I'm going to be going on a cruise with my wife in January. <laughs> Bring my Kevlar. Um, let me uh, ask, change the direction a little bit, ask just two final questions, then we'll open it up. Um, it, it does seem to me that you're part of a generation of general officers, people who came in really at the end of Vietnam or after Vietnam, um, and, and who've been leading our country's armed forces ever since 9-11. 
over 14 years of war. I guess I'm, you know, I'm curious whether you, first you'd accept that characterization and, and what you think of that generation, how you says that generation as compared to other generations. How should we think about it or am, am I barking up a, the wrong tree? I think it's a great, great question and, and it's something that uh, got into a lot of reading I am actually one of the very last uh, people that would have, peer groups that would, would have gotten a draft notice. And as we were talking a little earlier, I'm from Boston. It's a, it's, a, it's a green town, not to say that we don't have great soldiers from out of Boston, but in my neighborhood at least, you get the draft notice, sit down, if you pass your draft notice, you've then joined the Marine Corps, no self-respect, the guy was going to the service. <laughs> <laughs> and um, in the Marine Corps I was in, Barracks, it was E1, 2, E3, one year of college. And I, uh, the vast majority of the people in my, in my unit were wonderful guys, but um, you know, very low high school graduation rates, very high rate of, uh, of marijuana use, not so much the other drugs, but marijuana use. Um, rough, rough crowd, but all of them combat veterans, one, two, three. In, in Vietnam, um, but a very, very troublesome group of guys. Uh, very hard to deal with in terms of discipline. Um, in, in the, the Army was worse off. In the U.S. Army was worse off, not well for a lot of different reasons. But you know, in my in my view, the, the social tinkering that went on with our Army in the mid in the mid '60s nearly did, well brought it to the and the, and the, and the way we were they were required to fight the Vietnam War. At the end of all of that, in the early, the very early 1970s, our army was, was predictably um, broken. The Marine Corps, I would say, was just one percentage point from broken. Um, and so people like me, uh, having had to go into service, and then, in my, in my view, electing to stay, or in my case, electing to stay, uh, as a second lieutenant, 75, 76, and still today. Um, we never want that to happen again. And uh, the people who brought us out of that period, I think, were very, very brave men and women, most of whom back then. Uh, you know, the, the Barry McCaffrey's of the world, the, the, the uh, General Lou Wilson of my service, uh, who saw what happened to their, to their military, uh, how badly fought the Vietnam War, we were required to fight that war. The social tinkering that knocked them out of 100,000. Project 100,000, yeah. I did not realize it was actually 300,000. I didn't realize that no. until recently I read that it was actually about 300,000. But the point is, uh, the, the, the generation whose shoulders I stand on, again, the McCaffreys and people like that, were really heroic guys because every one of their class, if you will, got out and were disgusted with the way services were and the way our government was at, and they stayed and they rebuilt the U.S. military. And so when we went to war in, in, um, after 9-11, uh, vastly different military than, than it was certainly when I was in our unit. We owe them a great deal. Mm -hmm. So people give us, you know, myself and well, my generation credit, we stand on their shoulders. And there's, there's no rational reason in the world why those guys stayed in and unsupported undid the damage in the 70s and uh, No reason other than their love of their service and their, and their love of their country, I guess. So, I, I mean, I've, I really will stop asking questions and let them ask questions in a minute, but I, I, I've got to follow that one up. So, how, what do you think the next generation of general officers will be like? Guys for now, you know, the 06s, maybe one stars. How will they be different from your generation? I hope they're not different. Um, I, I I think I come from a generation of people that uh, of doubters, you know that that not there's very very few good ideas that come out of this city in, in terms of military. It's it's all out there where the troops are training, where lieutenants are given elbow room to train properly, where we have a great education. You know one of the one of the things I've come to realize in the U.S. military and. and and I work close to the State Department, great people, very, very good friends. But the thing that, that we have 
developed in U.S. military history. It's, it's cradle to grave professional military education. And I'm not talking about education systems and training. Thinking. Cradle to grave. You know, when you're a captain, you go to a school. When you're a major, you go to a school. You're a lieutenant colonel. There are seminars along the way. It's a, it's a, it's a cradle to grave education process uh, where you get people, you know, you essentially take a year off, go to school, and talk and think about science and the art of war. So that when you are confronted with tactical problems, um, you know there's a lot. There was a lot made about when the war in when we went. I was in the original invasion of Iraq when it went from this, uh, you know, maneuver, you know, tanks and things like that uh, effort. And, and in my case, took me from uh, Kuwait all the way to Beijing. I mean, I think it's the longest. I know it's the longest single movement in U.S. Marine Corps history. It's 750 miles. It might be, I don't know the distance from Normandy, the distance, it's got to be, uh, takes you at least into Germany. Yeah. And it's that kind of a distance. Uh, and of course, U.S. Army did the same thing on the left flank. Um, but when, when, the, when the, we had that summer of 03, when things started to turn in another direction, I didn't have anyone say, I mean, it was made, it was, it was points made in the press about this. I don't, on the ground in Iraq, there was no one saying, Gee, now they're using IEDs and they're shooting at us in, in terms of civil warfare. I don't know how to deal with this. And certainly my experience to include U.S. Army units that I worked with you know, immediately switched to a coin type, type strategy. Um, but there was some you know, chatter in the press and whatnot about how some people were complaining they hadn't been trained for this. My point is, I think as long as we continue this, this education process, we don't focus the officers, NCOs, the young people, on a style of war. This is a very complicated period. Of, I mean, we will have to do armor mechanized warfare or carrier against, you know, you know dogfight, all of the conventional end, all the way to what I think is probably the most uh, likely end, and that would be an Iraq, Afghanistan type situation or what we're trying to pull off here in Syria. Uh, and I think that's, that's dirty business on that end of the spectrum. It's really hard. Uh, one of the one of the things that uh, I'm going on too long, but one of the things I they didn't mean to do it, they didn't plan to do it, but <clears throat> the the, um, the Iraqi insurgents <clears throat> in 2003, 2004 essentially negated almost everything we are as a military force because we're so dependent, or we're so used to, and we deploy high tech electronics and all that, and they literally negated. All of that advantage, and then it became just infantry guys again looking for looking for insurgents. Brilliantly done, but they didn't really actually plan to do it. The first uh, the first few weeks, months in, in 2003, when they came at us with guns, they realized they, they lost every engagement. Uh, and they, and they, then we went into this lull, and then the IED started, and they were onto something there, and they realized. But we then again because we have educated officers now at the junior level and NCOs, they adjusted to that pretty quickly. Take our hits, we sure did. Um, but we didn't, we figured it out. Is the point. Okay, abs absolute last question, just as a Bostonian. So what is it with the Boston Irish and the Marine Corps? Well, um, it's uh, the Marine I mean, Corps brought You, General Dunford, I mean, it's... <laughs> You guys are everywhere. I don't, you know, I don't know. Boston used to be a, a huge Navy Marine Corps town. Uh, when I was a kid growing up, we had uh, permanently assigned aircraft carriers. That's when we had a really? big wow. Navy, uh, USS Wasp, and a couple other carriers. We had, uh, I think, probably a couple of dozen destroyers, uh, cruisers. Um, we had a Marine barracks there which, that had you know, 1,100 Marines. Um, so I think it's you know kind of part of that, and it. it uh, even though there's almost nothing up there to include Army, Air Force, or, yeah. or uh, it's, uh, it's, it's it stayed behind, if you will. So yeah. I mean, what, kind of an interesting early early on in, in the Marine Corps history or the Civil War period, we were called the Irish Soldiers, and it was because we, uh, when the Irish immigrants would get off the boats, they could speak English or kind of, and uh, they would recruit them right there, give them a job right on the spot, and. Um, and the, the large eastern cities had marine barracks in them, hundreds, if not a couple thousand Marines. So when we were when we were just prior to the Civil War and then, and then during the Civil War, they 
they were the only federal standing troops, um, but there was always this large contingent of Boston. Uh, actually, there's a, a story uh, during the uh, capturing slaves and returning them to, mm -hmm. to uh, slave owners in the South, and actually they called out the Marines because there were riots about not doing that, and actually the, the Marines were sympathetic to the rioters for not returning these slaves back to uh, that had been captured on the Underground Railroad. So I don't know. Guessing here, but, but Boston does love its Amen. Charlie Stevenson. Yeah, you wait if you could bring up the uh, the mic. Charlie Stevenson. I used to be at the National War College, and now I'm at SICE. General, because of your breadth of experience, I'd like to get your personal and professional views on defense reform. Do we need to rebalance the relations between the service chiefs and the combatant commanders? Do we need to rebalance the, uh, the roles of senior military and senior civilians in the Pentagon? Do we need to look at roles and missions again, especially given our heavy reliance on special operations forces? I, you know, I've done my level best to figure out what the problem is. You know, and I, I do think any time you have a system, you should look at it theoretically. heard a combatant commander say anything about a service chief other than thanks for doing the best you can to support me. Um, so I, there's no, to the best of my knowledge, uh, no tension between the service chiefs and the, and the uh, combatant commanders. Uh, I, I'm the combatant commander that gets almost nothing. I understand that, kind of, because, I mean, I, I say <coughs> I'm to make a joke, but you know, it's, it, there is no military threat from Latin America. No one's going to invade us. Um, but we do have this network that brings drugs in huge amounts into the United States. The end result of that is 40, 50, or 40, 4,000 Americans will die of drug overdoses, mostly, vast majority from the stuff that comes up from my part of the world. And somehow I think that's a threat of some type. Uh, we don't seem to be doing an awful lot about it because we're, you know, our Navy and, and our, uh, you know, ISR and whatnot are in other parts of the world. But, um, Again, I'm the uh, COCOM that works, that tries to mitigate by working with our unbelievable great allies like Columbia and, of course, the FBI and the DEA and people like that. Um, but I have never heard anyone complain about the services not providing everything they can provide to the, to the COCOMs that, uh, even in my own case, I get some support, and it's uh, great support. So the first issue, I don't see the tension. see the issues of roles and missions at all. I think, you know, again, I think we'd, we'd be making a mistake if we didn't have a, uh, you know, a force that was agile across the field, ready to operate at, at any end. I mean, the Special Forces guys are, in fact, very focused and do wonderful things within that focus area. I think the other services have to be much more agile uh, and, and, and prepared to do things across the bottom and broader spectrum. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we've been through this before. Yeah. The one thing I would argue studies to be done about it, about an interagency kind of uh, cohort of missions. Gentleman over here. Thank you very much. Inigo Guevara. I'm with James. I'm a con defense consultant there. And uh, my question is, uh, General, do you think that uh, Cuba should be under Southcom, or would it be preferable to be uh, for it to be under Northcom so that Northcom could leverage its relationship with Mexico uh, to improve U.S. ties with, with Cuba directly. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah probably for the foreseeable future, Cuba will be very, very slow in the process of improvement. Um, you know, the opening of relations with Cuba carried 
positive event in my part of the world, mostly actually from the point of view of the countries that I deal with, which is what my friend was saying, you know, <coughs> kind of about time. Uh, now, now there's no reason to criticize guys in our little regions we have amongst ourselves. Uh, I think the impression now that the U.S., I think, and I, and I don't work here, believe me, but I think the U.S. is is hoping this would go faster. Um, and uh, you guys know this, how the administration is uh, the big U.S. Uh, <coughs> and I think the Cubans are wanting it to go slower, so it's kind of ironic. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't, right now, it's probably where it ought to be. We all hope that things really, really start to blossom and, and people will be better off. And, but you know, you're still, you're still dealing with a, you know, a fairly repressive regime without a lot of political freedom. Certainly no freedom of the press, human rights issues to say the least. All of those things have to change. So, and I think they will over time. Uh, I pray they will because people in the first century deserve better. You know, the Cuban people have in terms of those things that they can uh, economically. I think already started to improve in terms of producing a lot of people coming back with you know, Cuban cigars. That's kind of a big thing in Miami right now. But, uh, <coughs> there's always be Cuban cigars in Miami. But yeah, that, they were, I was going to say, they were there before. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's probably where it ought to be. But really, right now, it's State Department that's, that's running the show. We just had an interesting, if I, just yeah. say, we, we do a lot of conferences, uh, human rights, uh, not oh, human rights conferences that I sponsor. Humanitarian assistance conferences, such as those, uh, drug trafficking type conferences. Uh, I have offered certainly to the State Department, you know, it might make sense that low level military to military contact, it's in everyone's interest, those, those topics to be ready. That might be something that we invite the, the Cubans to. The, uh, the uh, USNS Comfort just finished its 90 day deployment, saw 125,000 patients. Phenomenal deployment. It was in Haiti. I suggested to state maybe that we invite the uh, Cubans have some Haitian or have some uh, doctors in Port-au-Prince, maybe invite them aboard. Uh, we did that. They came aboard, and it was a great couple of days that they were aboard the ship. And then they invited uh, some of our docs from the Comfort to uh, go into Port-au-Prince and see their clinics. Tiny, tiny step. But a big <coughs> uh, gentleman in the second row. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Luis Alonso with the AP. Many thanks for, for this opportunity. General, I would like to ask you about uh, Venezuela. They claim uh, that a U.S. Coast Guard plane violated the national airspace early this month, and their defense minister described completely unusual not only the plane incident, but also the fact that the, the aircraft, uh, George Washington, will be near Venezuela by the time of the le legislative elections on December the 6th. If you could please, would like to give a comment about that. Thank you. Sure. I always start off a comment about Venezuela saying, I hope this doesn't hurt their feelings. Uh, and I don't mean the Venezuelan people. But I spent exactly no time thinking about Venezuela. Uh, they're on a path that only the Venezuelan people can change. Um, we are obviously always stand ready if there was some type of a humanitarian disaster, something that I would be working through the UN or OAF or something. But I spend no time worrying about uh, worrying about that. Now, to the, to the airplane, yes. The airplane was on a counter-drug mission. It flew, we think, well, we know, about three and a half minutes within the 12-mile limit, but no closer than nine miles. It was actually uh, not the main wing, but uh, on an island. He admitted to it, apologized for it. Um, and uh, no issues. But great, great people. Uh, but we don't really work with them because the State Department handles that. And, and the, the, size, the presence of the aircraft here, the, can you have any relationship as they came into the area? I mean, three years ago, the USS George Washington was scheduled to go around Latin America to the coast of Tampa to the canal, too big, and go to uh, Norfolk to be defueled and refueled a few years ago. And in doing that, it's uh, making its way past coming no closer to Venezuela, really, than the Caribbean. I mean, so it's, it has, there's no relationship at all. Gentleman in the fourth row. 
Uh, Ted Voorhees, Covington and Berlin. Uh, General, thanks for being here and th thanks for your service. Uh, I'm tempted to ask one follow-up Venezuela question, unfortunately. Uh, there w there's news reports recently that Maduro has said that uh, he's going to win this election, but if he doesn't win this election, nothing's going to change. Uh, does that cause you any concern and uh, do you think it might raise the level of your engagement in Venezuela uh, issues in the coming months? Honestly, I, I can't emphasize enough how little time I spent thinking about Venezuela. Um, it's, they're, on, they're on their own course. Um, people's got to work out. You know, people don't think that they've got a, a big deal there now economically, socially, and all that. They certainly can try to change it. That's up to them. I spend really no time worrying about Venezuela, other than, a, you know, as I mentioned, if, God forbid, something bad happened there relative to uh, humanitarian disaster, something like this, you know, and if I was told to, 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 to help, but all, all of that would be done through, you know, World Food and, and the UN and that kind of thing. But uh, you know, kind of back on the gentleman's comment there, uh, as we were chasing what we knew was a boat that just pushed maybe a ton of cocaine, made a run out of uh, Venezuela, put a ton of cocaine, we were following it back to where it came from, I suppose. See where it came from. Um, would have been nice to get a little more cooperation uh, from Venezuela in terms of this counter drug thing. But I can't emphasize enough, this drug influence is so corrupted, uh, so detrimental to all the societies that we want that has any, any sense of decency, or would want to want to join hands, shoulder to shoulder, together to get at this drug problem. Uh, and we have unbelievable uh, cooperation from almost every country in Latin America. Um, a couple that don't, and I'll let it go at that. Uh, yeah, back there in the one, two, three, four, fifth row, yeah. Oh. Oh. So in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, sorry, Yeltsi Bogoslavsky, Yelet School of International Affairs. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the military developed uh, a new independent and holistic paradigm of warfare to counter the insurgency. Is it possible that some kind of same new holistic paradigmatical approach could be developed in your region for the military to counter the transnational crime networks, especially now when the nexus between the crime and terrorism is growing? Thank you. it already has. I mean, we have uh, heavy, heavy presence. We have a lot of presence in terms of U.S. Uh, law enforcement, Homeland Security, Customs and Border Protection, things like that, FBI, DEA. Uh, they're already working in, in many ways shoulder to shoulder with countries, some countries that are not politically friendly to us sometimes, that trade contacts. Uh, the, the problem in some of these countries, a big problem, you know, we take for granted in the United States that we have uh, police departments who that really do protect and serve the American people. Very, very clean, little corruption. We take that for granted. We take for granted that we have the FBI and the, and the NSA and the CIA and organizations like that that are constantly out there looking for threats, developing counter network uh, strategies, things like that, sharing with partner countries. Uh, the countries, particularly those that are on the trans transit routes of drugs, are so uh, impacted by drug networks will be you know, unlimited amounts of money to either you know, bribe, intimidate, or kill, that these countries barely have, in some respects, a uh, functioning legal justice system when it comes to uh, things other than state police. Uh, most of their police are very, very heavily corrupt uh, or intimidated, so they don't do their job. And ironically, the, the military, not ironically, the militaries, as in, in our own country, or, or military tends to be the most respected, admired institution in most of the countries that I work in, with exceptions sometimes of the Catholic Church. They're the most accepted, the most admired. The people want to see them. I'll give you an example of Honduras, uh, Guatemala, El Salvador. Uh, the police are completely intimidated by the violence uh, or, or bribed away from doing their jobs. Uh, the military likes to, uh, or the people like to see the military on the street too two free men, uh, women, increasingly women, working alongside the police. Uh, the police are doing police work, but the military there to oversee <coughs> to just make sure everyone's, uh, just to make 
security in the world, honestly. Um, you know, we in the United States, uh, the, most of the West, I think, don't see um, don't see that that a military is best used internally. Uh, the military that we deal with don't like to be used internally. They want to stay in the dirty business. They don't want to see their soldiers corrupt. But if that's all they got, if they're, they're an extremist, all they have, the only functioning security force is, uh, is the military. By the way, they run the military through uh, anywhere from four weeks to now three months of police type training. So they're not out there shooting first and asking questions later kind of thing. But as we see in France, no more progressive country in the world, what was their first reaction? First reaction is to get soldiers and Marines into the police. Uh, I myself, in my career, have been deployed once here in Washington on the streets because of the riots back in the 70s, and once into LA because of the Bay Bridge riots. So we ourselves do it. We don't like to do it. No one likes to do it. Um, but if it's all you got, maintain some, some semblance of uh, security as you try to rebuild your. Did you have a, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, General. My name is Jose Cardenas. I'm a uh, consultant with Vision Americas here in Washington, and I served in Bush 43 in several Latin America positions. And I uh, wanted to really uh, thank you for your leadership at Southcom. Those of us who, who care about the hemisphere are going to miss you. Um, your candor. Your, your candor, and uh, frankly, you are the practically the only U.S. official that, that has been speaking about the transnational criminal threat that we face uh, from our southern uh, uh, direction. And I, I just hope that we don't, uh, we don't find out the hard way what their, uh, what their ultimate capabilities are. I wanted to ask you about Colombia, going back to Colombia, and um, obviously a, uh, a, a very controversial uh, peace process underway, uh, more controversial inside Colombia than uh, outside Colombia, which uh, tells you something there. Um, but looking over the horizon, General, what do you see? Say that there is a gr an agreement completed with the FARC. Uh, we're looking around March uh, of next year. What do you see as the U.S. role, Southcom's role, in helping the Colombians win the peace? And we all know what that means. That means the implementation of the agreement and uh, helping the, the Colombians do some things that they have never done before. And that is establish government presence in some of the conflict zones, uh, weaning people away from the coca economy uh, in, 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 into uh, sustainable jobs uh, there. So that's going to be a, a huge challenge uh, for the U.S. government and specifically for, for Southcom that has been so uh, involved in Colombia for the last uh, 15, 20 years? It is a great question, and, it, and I, I guess I would start by saying um, the Colombians are a remarkably capable people, society, democracy. Um, I, uh, I, I sometimes hesitate to make any recommendations to the Colombians because they are, they don't need much in the way of help. They, you know, if you look at Plan Colombia, very little U.S. money. Uh, a lot of U.S intelligence and information sharing, a lot of U.S. encouragement, uh, confidence in them. They really kind of did it all themselves. As far as the, the kind of things that they face, they have to take roughly 8,000 FARC and integrate them into society. I don't say reintegrate them, because remember, the FARC is a serial human rights violator and has been for years. They, they, they kidnap the foot soldiers when they're 12, 13, 14 years and they make them camp workers. And, and the young women get the added deal of being sex slaves for a few years until they get too old, I think 19, 20, and then they put them into uh, fighting forces in Cuba. It's horrific what they do to the young people and to the young women. It's just horrific. Uh, that said, they have integrated, not reintegrated, because these young people were never really part of society. Story I, uh, when 
I went to one of their reintegration sites a little over a year ago in college. A young woman there, uh, just 29 years old, very, very attractive. And I say that because um, when she was about 12 and they, and they came to the, to the village, someone noticed her and one of the park guys said, we'll be back in a couple of years for you. And they came back and, and brought her into the park. She'd been pregnant, I think, 14 times uh, in, in the, in, when she was entered the park when she was about 13, 14 pregnancies roughly. Uh, all of them uh, jungle abortions in the park on life say so there are women also don't allow them to, to have the show. It's just horrific. So the point is that they have integrated 33,000 over the years of parksters who have come out on their own into their society with, with a pretty low return rate. So they know they know what they're doing. Um, I think what the U.S. has to do is continue the assistance we're already providing. I mean, understand, because I think the Colombian government understands the peace dividend one of the first conversations I had with the senior, most senior officials in Colombia, this is three years ago almost. Do you think the last 50 years has been hard? The first 10 after the peace agreement have been really hard. Uh, and I would say the same thing to my own troops in the United States. So to stick with them, it's probably maybe the only foreign policy success story we've had in the last 40 years. Um, and we really don't provide them all that much other than encouragement and stand with them. They're our best partners. Oh, by the way, they are already contributing to peace movements uh, around the world. They're what we call, or what they call, exporting uh, security. So they have sent teams to the Dominican Republic, Honduras, uh, Central American countries. Uh, they work, they sent uh, contact or mobile training teams out to talk to human rights uh, and coin tactics, anti-IED tactics. Uh, they are an incredibly responsible partner and in the world, and as the, as the violence, or as, if they get a peace agreement, you can bet they will reorient themselves. They're already planning it. We become more of a regional partner and more of a global partner. I'll end by, by saying they deployed for six months. Colombia is here. Somalia is here. They deployed one of their frigates in Somalia to join the uh, counter-piracy operations there. And for a good portion of their time, protected ships going into Somalia to drop off uh, food supplies. They did that, small contribution, but they did that to, to make a, a statement to the, to the world and to the United States that we will become uh, world players in the arena of basic uh, or, or participants in things like this uh, more and more once they get out from under this fog of devastation. Okay, I think we've got time for just two more questions. So, film right over there. Good afternoon, General Kelly. I'm uh, Scott Cooper with uh, Human Rights First. I actually served in the Marine Corps to you several years ago. I wonder if I could draw you out again um, about defense reform. Um, you mentioned that uh, interagency reform is something to look at. I recall General Pace when he was chairman. That was a constant theme of his. We need to make the interagency process work. Um, you kind of hedged there and said I'd take a look at it. What ideas do you have for how we might make that work better in the future? jointness of the U.S. military has worked so well. Um, you know, before we were in four stovepipes, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, and, and, and a number of other stovepipes. The stovepipes all, right, you know, at every level along, you know, we're still, we're, we're still working our own lanes, but there's, there's constant communication all the way up, and of course, it's just natural for guys like me, guys, and, you know, men and women like me, that the jointness thing has, has worked and it's a good thing. Again, back to the question, I mean, I think we always ought to be looking at things all the time. But it's the stovepipe, uh, and if you if you work at uh, or if you look at the rest of the U.S. government, there's uh, I always make the joke that I'm sad that it's true. Outside Washington, things actually work pretty well. I mean, if you go in the, my part of the world, the FBI agents and the DEA agents work together, like each other, to work to bring after war. No rice bowl, but they're getting at, they're getting after it my part of the world, and I suspect in other parts of the world. They're mission focused, and they know that they've got to work together. HSI, uh, Homeland Security Resource Division, uh, the Department of Treasury, that uh, is their, their office that goes after foreign threat financing. I mean, out there it's working. Uh, back here, it's the stovepipe. I mean, I get a lot of questions. Uh, I think 
because of the U.S. military's approach to doing this, that is to say, what's the problem? Let's work a solution. Let's put a plan together. Let's make it happen. Um, because of that, I'm probably outside my lane a lot. In fact, I know I am. And I'm constantly told this is not your job, um, whatever this is. And I say, I know it's kind of your job, but you're not doing it. So I'll do it. Uh, you can come to the conference in Miami or here in Washington. Uh, and it tends to then, you know, people then are now oftentimes trying to run to catch up. So what I would say is, how do we make, how do we break down those, uh, those, those, uh, those little pipes so that people are talking to each other right along, so that you don't have to go to the Pentagon, you know, Kelly doesn't have to go to the Pentagon, over to the, over to the Justice Department, then down into the bowels of the Justice Department to talk to the person. Why can't I simply call my dude? Whatever level, and say, why don't you come to this conference in Miami, or why don't you know that, that kind of thing. So, I think we could be better at it. Uh, the coordination just can't be done at, at the top. It's got to be, it's got to be wide open. I think. So that's what I would say. Okay, I think the lady over there will get the last question. <clears throat> so it's better to be a good one. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, I'm Shun Murray. I'm a professor at the American University. Uh, and I, I'm curious about how you would describe your, uh, whether you would describe having a diplomatic role in uh, Southcom, and um, how you work with the State Department, and uh, whether there's a tension between your regional <laughs> outlook and their primarily bilateral outlook. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's a great question. And first of all, I, I would never say I have a diplomatic role. That is the State Department's role. But I have an incredible. I have uh, very, very good relationships with almost all of the military. You know, the military and military, that includes the ministers of defense, very, very good. Um, in many, many, many countries, um, I've personal relationships with the presidents. Um, I uh, never try, never violate that. And the U.S. ambassador is, or his, his label, his or her label is, yeah, the senior representative of the President of the United States in that country. Uh, I have, I think I, probably all of the COCOMs have tremendous relationships with the, uh, with the uh, ambassadors and country teams. And, and within those country teams, FBI, DEA, all of that kind of thing. Uh, some very, very, very good relationships. Um, but you're right, they very definitely bilateral. So the ambassador in his particular country deals with Washington. I was surprised, for example, uh, when we were developing this more regional approach with the uh, Central American countries that, um, I mean, with the problems of the three, particularly the Northern Tier countries, and I throw Belize into that as well, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and I throw Belize into that place, it's risky, uh, you know, not quite on the edge, but, it's, but we've got to include them in our discussion. I was surprised. in those countries weren't talking to each other. We in the military, uh, you know, have this kind of biased reaction. So when we go into something, first thing we start figuring out is what, what's my, what are my authorities, what are my prerogatives, who's on my right, who's on my left, I start talking to them. Um, so I was actually, as I say, surprised that there's not a lot of conversation amongst the uh, ambassadors. It's just the way they work. Uh, and, and the responsibility for the regional approach is Big, big state here in D.C. Um, so that, that's the way they do it. Uh, but you know, there's certainly no conflict. I've, I've had uh, ambassadors call. Uh, I mean, the ambassadors call me all the time for help, sometimes for help with the State Department. Uh, <laughs> you know, can you convince them that? Um, I, I think it's a trust thing. There was one country I won't, uh, I won't go into, a Central American country, when I first took over. They had had an event there where, and this is a, and I'll end with this maybe, but this is something that military people got to keep in mind, and we're not, we forget sometimes. We have a very different language, we have a very different way of operating, and we need to look at the people we're dealing with, uh, people in our own government, and, and, and appreciate that. There was one, and 
fast food, very, very, I mean, happened before my time, but, but in a sense, it was a counter-drug operation that, um, in my view, as a military guy, didn't go that bad, but embarrassed the country team, not embarrassed. The country team was not ready for the possibility of violence. And when there was violence, it caught them completely off guard, or at least in bad. And uh, one of my first trips was to go down there and uh, on my, my first trip around in the new job. And uh, the ambassador was telling me about how she hadn't been briefed on this and it caught her by surprise. And no one had ever told her it would be violent. I said, okay, you have uh, trained by DEA uh, local forces at night going into places where there are narco-terrorists, drug traffickers, and why did you not think there could be some, you know, some violence? So again, our fault. We did not brief her before my time. We did not brief her enough on the possibility. Of, this is what happens if it works perfectly. This is what happens if it doesn't work perfectly. And this is what happens if it goes bad. Now again, back to, the, back to the way you look at it. In my world, working perfectly getting the drugs, and if you had a gunfight and killed some bad guys, that's still in the perfectly column. In uh, <laughs> her world, it's, you know, and I'm not making this kind of a joke, this is literally true. So we have, uh, I have endeavored to be very close to the ambassadors. Do anything they ask me to do, I don't do anything, I always do it, uh, but to trust them. And as I tell, uh, you know, when I work for Secretary Panetta, one thing, wonderful gentleman. One thing they said is, when you have people come in here to brief me, have them speak English, not military, and they are god awful slobs. Don't bring, don't come in here and try to razzle dazzle me with the slobs. That's what military people need to do. We have a culture that we need to somehow mesh into other people's culture. Otherwise, it's just not a thing. It's like every other country you're dealing with. Any What a great discussion. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, thank you for a uh, career of extraordinary and exemplary service to our country. Thank you. Thank you. I'll follow you. Yep. All right.